Welcome to the latest in our series of Just Society Facebook Live Chats. Today I'm joined by Professor Jackie Gabb, Hello. Professor of Sociology and Intimacy, and also the stream lead in one of the research streams in our Citizenship and Governance Strategic Research Area, and the stream is called Private Lives, Public <laughs> Intimacies. Is that right? It is, um, and I know that you know, some people struggle with you know, the, the public and the private mm. in that. And that's intentional. Um, it's meant, to, um, it's designed as a title to, to bring to the fore that there is an intersection between the private and the public. So there's an assumption that people go home mm -hmm. and they shut their front doors and this is their kingdom. You know, this is what they do and everything they do is private within that contained space. So the home, for example, well, actually, that's not the case. What we do in our private lives is very much influenced by policy, by what the politicians say, and by cultural norms. So um, we can take as an example, you know, the, the decriminalisation of homosexuality. It was only in 1967 when mm -hmm. it became legal for gay men over the age of 21 to have sex in private in their house. Before that, it was illegal. And, it, you know, and it's still then, you know, public sex or, you know, um, under the age 21. So all of those things are very strictly, strictly regulated. And so the title itself, Private Lives, Public <laughs> Intimacies, is designed to, to raise that tension between the public and the private. Thank you, that's great. And to celebrate this uh, 50th anniversary, the BBC and the Open University have got a, a television programme, a couple of programmes, mm -hmm. Uh, the overall title, Prejudice and Pride. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that about and how does a, a leading academic get involved in a mm. television mm. program? Um, well, it's part of the Queer Britain series to, um, to mark the occasion of decriminalisation of homosexuality. And the reason it's important is the BBC and the OU has a long-standing tradition of collaboration and so you know we always look at well what are the opportunities here mm -hmm. and it seemed to us that they they were you know a great opportunity to say you know the OU is a fantastic institution which is committed to equality of opportunity mm -hmm. so it says you know queer queer communities are part of that obviously yeah. LGBT communities are part of that and a lot of our students may be drawn from that community um, so that, that's part of it. It's also because then we can lead some of those things into our teaching, into our curriculum. So mm -hmm. we have excellent um, curriculum around criminology and psychology, which deals with issues around sexuality and obviously sociology and law and other areas as well, but curriculum around um, psychology and criminology particularly saying, you know, what are the pertinent issues around sexuality? Mm. And so we can tie in programmes which have a mass appeal, but also, you know, are funded by the BBC and produced by the BBC, so they have a, you know, a, a popular angle. Um, and we can tie those into curriculum, and it enlivens it and, it, and it brings the subject to life in a way that teaching materials on their own right. cannot necessarily achieve. So you, as a leading professor at the Open University, you see this not as a kind of odd add-on, mm. but as integral to what you do, mm. bringing, yeah. bringing together the kind of dream of an open and just society mm. with your professional expertise. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's the beauty, <laughs> the beauty of working here is there, there's a, and it is a political mission, you know, there, mm. there is a social justice mission here at the Open University as well. Um, and so, you know, when, I, when someone like myself has the opportunity to work on a series of programmes and give um, academic input, so basically we're providing the, the research evidence, you know, checking that all of it's factually accurate right. and, and how they're putting this forward. What, th what that means is we can actually say, yeah, let, let's try and move beyond the student base and actually get some of these messages out further afield. And the, and the particular programmes from the BBC are interesting because they're crowdsourced, which means they're... There are no experts, which is, you know, it's the, the beauty of the People's History series, mm. is it's not academics, you know, you, you don't always need academics on television by mm. any means, and it's not celebrity, and, and, that's where, and it's not dramatised. So what you've got is, you know, quote, real people talking about their lives. About so there's the a subtitle which is the People's History of yes. LGBTQ. Yes. Britain. Absolutely, and, and it's part of a bigger series on the people's history that is always crowdsourced, which basically means people put up their stories, usually around an object, a sort of memorabilia. So, you know, yeah. this is a, a pin badge that I used to wear, or this is a wig I used to dawn, or something like that. And then they tell their story. And, and that means what you've got is, is a grassroots programme which shows some of the more nuanced and sensitive 
dimensions rather than the flag-waving celebrity. Yeah, but when I say that you're a leading professor as you are a, a research star and so on, that must mean, that does mean, I know, that you've conducted surveys of, of people's sexual lives and relationships mm. and so on. So you must know more than a member of the public. Mm. And there must be some points in the programme where the producers or, or the member of the public wants to say such and such, and you, say, you think anyway, well, that's not actually what happens. Mm. So how do you then, as an academic, mm. decide whether to speak up? Do people listen to you? In the, in the programme yeah, making in the making process. of the programme. I think that's what um, students find fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's a really interesting point. I mean, we don't have absolute editorial control can we mm. be clear <laughs> you know yeah. I, I'm, I'm yes. not in the editing suite but no. we do see rough cuts and, and yeah. you see the process going forward if there is um, as I say factual inaccuracy which they always creep in you know because yeah. as you say a member of the public says something and it doesn't mean it's true yeah. actually any more than an, an academic <laughs> editor sometimes um, but yes yeah, so we then would say well you know you need to edit that out because that's actually not quite true or it's more nuanced than mm. that I think the bigger input we have is say, well, you know, you've covered that angle, but how about you think about this angle? Mm. So, for example, we were very clear that we wanted stories that weren't all celebratory. Yeah. Because it feels like, yeah, 50 years since decriminalisation, isn't this fantastic? Let's celebrate. OK, I'll buy that. Let's celebrate. Let's bring that into pride celebrations, etc. Yeah. And we should certainly mark the occasion. But we also need to reflect upon what hasn't been gained. What are the losses? we were very clear we have to still acknowledge that homophobic crime is rising it is not lessening i mean it, it you know it, it used to peak in its come name but it is still there it mm. is really shocking how many queer people are in fear of their lives in recent research that i've completed people were still talking about young couples especially i find most shocking young couples were talking about being fearful of holding hands in public and again goes back to the title of the stream if you've got a 20-something couple saying, I won't hold hands with my partner, as innocuous as holding hands of, if I held your hand, Simon, mm. no one would think anything about it. Mm. If I held a female partner's hand, there is a, a fear for my, my, my you know, sense of well-being. It might be that I was attacked. It might be that I was abused, certainly verbally abused. Mm. And that still carries on. So we're very clear that sort of line has to be brought in, that yes. we haven't reached some sort of sense of equality and everything's fantastic and let's all party now. That is not where we're at. OK, but let me give you another example of perhaps interpretation of how it all happened. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, I'm a professor of law. In fact, my first book, here's a plug, <laughs> um, um, was on this very topic, the relationship with law and morality, because of, <laughs> this is a lawyer's view, in 1957 there was the Wolfenden Report, and it took 10 years before it was implemented in the Sexual Offences Act. So mm -hmm. in a sense, it's the 60th anniversary of Wolfram, <laughs> the 50th anniversary of the Act. But actually, I know some people say, but those are both really about gay men mm -hmm. because lesbianism wasn't criminalised in mm. the same way. Mm. And actually, maybe those things weren't as important as academic lawyers say they are. Mm. So let's say that that comes up in the programme. Mm. Um, has the if you like, the general gay rights issue being hijacked by the male side of this. Mm, mm. What then happens in, in behind the scenes mm. in terms of, you say, well, it's maybe this, maybe that. Mm. Do, do producers listen to the... Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Would they not listen to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a debate, isn't there, about what, uh, do we need experts in science? Yeah, well, um, and, and it wouldn't, you know, it's not just me speaking yes, as, as a yes. lesbian woman, you know, a, yeah. a, a colleague, a gay male colleague um, would sure. make the same point and be listened to, I'm sure, as well. Yeah. But yes, of course, that there was a, a gender uh, dimension to it. We wanted to make sure there was um, not equal representation because it isn't, you know, the programme is not designed for that. That would be yeah. something far more academic. But it is saying we need um, an equality of voice. So, yes, what, what is the perspective? And it's explicitly talked about in the programmes of, you know, you're right, there is no such thing still on the statute books as lesbian sex. Mm -hmm. You know, lesbian sex doesn't exist because we can't describe it allegedly in culture or in the law. Mm. And so that's really interesting. That is there in the programme. But also, you know, what did that mean in um, equality pride marches? What did that mean in personal lives that were lived as queers within movements? And an example would be, an interesting example would be within something like the Section 28 debates which a lot of that was around pretended families and the teaching, the alleged teaching of pretended families is normal mm. in schools and pretended families yes. actually, of course, means um, same-sex parent families. 
And what was interesting, yes, that the story that leads to that in some ways is, you know, it's, it's um, around gay men because it was around the book um, which depicted a gay male couple. And of course, yeah. that was topical and, and so, um, it was so responded to with such vehemence, I guess, because there's always the spectre of paedophilia. Mm. And, and with lesbians, of course, it is meant to be the safest environment. Now, you know, you can debate the rights yeah. and wrongs of that as a position. But I think what happened with the, the, the lesbian rights program, with it, the, the lesbian stories within it, sorry, was um, around parents, both gay men and lesbians, talking about how they engage with Section 28. Mm. But then also there's a very poignant story, for example, of a lesbian mother who lost custody of her daughters because mm. she was not allowed to keep children who were girls because of that she might turn them into lesbians. Right. You know, and, and that was in the 80s. And that's, you know, it, I, you know, I still cry when I see it. Mm. It is a heartrending story in my own research on the subject. I've heard that story before. So she lost the custody of her two daughters and could only oh. parent her son. Oh. Well, look, I know that students want two other issues just raised, but it has to be very <coughs> brief. But one is, how did attitudes change so quickly towards the end of mm. these 50 years? Mm. Uh, can you give us a clue on that? Uh, it is interesting. I mean, even in the last 10 years, the same-sex mm. marriage stuff, who would have thought that? Yeah. Um, and who might want it as well? Mm. Um, <laughs> it, it's, I guess it's cumulative. So yeah. once you start a snowball, it just sort of keeps on building yeah. and, and there's a logic to that. Yeah. However, in, if you want to be, you know, in, in some ways devil's advocate, there's also the point of what it is as a process of normalization. Mm. So the rights that have been won, in mm -hmm. theory won, mm -hmm. are about um, a heteronorm. So they're about coupledom, they're about marriage, they're about having children. And actually a consequence of what's happened is those who aren't in couple relationships, those who are in triadic relationships, those who don't want to partner, or those who are in relationships, for example, if someone's not a UK citizen, they are actually further demonised by the equality rights that have been achieved. Right, that's an interesting point, yes. So finally, is it difficult talking about these things? And again, I think students are interested in this because students want to mm. debate these issues, but they don't want to be trolled, obviously, and we don't want anybody to be treated badly. But if, if I can give a, a personal example, when I used to work in Northern Ireland, and I wrote a paper for the Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights advocating mm. the equalization of age uh, mm. for uh, gay people as well as for heterosexuals. Got a lot of abuse for that, but still. I was on a program in Northern Ireland in which half of it was on terrorism and half of it was on this issue. <laughs> and I was in both halves as one of these academic experts. But I was the only person who wasn't silhouetted. And I was mm. talking to the producers about this. As, well, uh, people are scared to comment. Mm. Now, on the terrorism, nobody thought that I was a terrorist because I was talking about terrorism. Mm. But people did assume that mm. if you were talking about gay rights, you were some kind mm. of gay rights campaigner. Mm. So is it a difficult issue to talk about, or, or is it, for a professor of sociology mm. and intimacy, no problem at all? Certainly in, in, you know, in 21st century, absolutely no problem at all. Um, and, I, you know, and that is a privileged position in the sense of, you know, I, 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 I have reached some academic standing, but also I, I'm not challenging anything particularly apart from saying, you know, there should be equality. So in a way that's easy. It is a moot point in the sense of I remember when I was first researching this back in the day in the early <laughs> 90s and I was always in uh, lesbian parenting specifically and I was invited on lots of chat shows and Kilroy mm. back in the day <laughs> um, Kilroy chat shows and it was like no I won't do those things yeah. um, because you do get a lot of um, you, well, one, the, the, the presenter might want to make a feature of you know yes. well what about your child what about you know you've got a son what does he think about you and I've always very much included my own child, you know, in terms mm. of is this okay if I do this or that? Mm. And, and I think 30 years ago, 25 years ago, it was a problem. I don't see it being such a problem today for certain groups. However, that said, I think, you know, within the LGBT, I'm, I'm quite a normative looking person. I present as, you know, a female and therefore I'm far less likely to be trolled than other um, sexual minority groups or um, people who might identify as gender queer, for example. So I think it's a particular experience and we should think about that being a situated experience. Jackie, thank you very much for being so open uh, about this very important topic of, of our times, uh, of a just society. 
And for those who are interested in other aspects of this, uh, we're coming back at 2.30 with Hugh McFall, a colleague of mine, to talk about can you have a just society when there are legal aid cuts and so on. But that's a rather <laughs> loyally topic of my interest. I think this, is, this has been a fantastic opportunity Thank to you. listen to you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you very much.